Well, essentially, sensory systems are our gateway to the external world. So we listen to uh, everything surrounding us. And when I say listen, we smell, we see, we taste, we hear. General chemical senses, both olfaction and taste, are rather uh, less studied. Um, I guess it's probably because it's more subtle for us. We don't really realize the impact of smell or taste in our daily lives. We usually are visual animals. We hear, we see each other. Uh, but we actually also smell each other a lot. Uh, in my lab, I try to look at those brain areas that can take the olfactory information. Looking at how these areas can combine the incoming sensory information, like olfaction, with our internal states, uh, like the hunger. So, for example, when you're hungry and when you smell food, uh, you know, you're happy, you start salivating. If you're not hungry, uh, you don't really care that much. Or, for example, if you're stressed, and if you smell food, it's also a complete different reaction. So essentially the major interest of mine is to really try to understand how these internal states, fear, hunger, sometimes even arousal, sexual arousal, can modulate uh, sensory processing. They are evolutionarily the earliest senses. So a bacteria also actually have a chemical sense that can attract the bacteria to a source or averse. Uh, in that sense, you can also see in the brain, the olfactory pathways actually took a very different pathway compared to other sensory modalities, such as vision or auditory system, where the input actually goes through the thalamus to a lot of cortical areas. So there's a lot of cortical processing, whereas the olfactory system, it also goes to the cortex, uh, but actually it goes to other brain areas, such as hypothalamus, uh, parts of the limbic system. And this is actually really interesting because uh, these are the areas that directly control your emotional states. So actually smelling can really sort of change your emotional states and, and, and essentially entering a room, not smelling great, uh, doesn't feel great. Uh, whereas, you know, if you smell a perfume, for example, of your lover, uh, it can also bring you to those moments very quickly. It immediately activates our limbic areas, which is essentially those areas closer to our animal ancestors, if I may say. So essentially in my lab, we're interested in looking at small brains um, and trying to understand how these small brains take in information and do something with it which eventually generates a behavior. And these small brains are zebrafish and fruit fly. And, and the major reason why we're looking at small brains is because they're small. Uh, so the system that we have to understand is actually rather less complex than higher organisms. But also, both of these uh, systems, fruit flies and zebrafish, they have genetic tools. And this means we can actually, it's a bit like shopping, you go to a shop and you say, today I want to record the activity of set of neurons and then you can take a fish line that you, allows you to do this. Tomorrow you may want to silence these neurons and then you just go to the store in your lab and you can use light or chemicals to silence specific groups of neurons. So both model animals allows you to do these kind of experiments. There are some animals that are super tasters or super smellers like, like dog. There are animals who have amazing vision like birds. Um, but the, the pathways uh, that carries the information across most vertebrates and even invertebrates, including the fly, uh, they can actually be very similar. For example, when you look at the olfactory bulb of a fruit fly, which is called antelope, or a zebrafish olfactory bulb, or a mammalian olfactory bulb, like a mouse, um, their general architecture is uh, extremely similar, surprisingly similar, uh, which was conserved across these sort of huge evolutionary tree. Uh, so therefore, I think it is still possible to get a lot of exciting information by working on different model systems and perhaps even compare them. Because, you know, yes, um, a zebrafish brain is very different than a human brain, but a monkey brain is also very different than a human brain. Uh, and I think, it's, in, it's interesting to look at those differences, but it's even more exciting actually to find those commonalities because then using those commonalities, you can perhaps build brains, right? You can build artificial brains because the hope is that uh, smaller the brains, uh, 
these circuits going to be easier for us to build or maybe even simulate.